All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. This is Lou Huger, Associate Educator at the University of Idaho Extension Office here in Boise. I work statewide, but I mostly focus on commercial produce safety that has to do with the Food Safety Modernization Act and the Produce Safety Rule. So today we're going to be talking about um, basically hygienics on the farm and how to instill good hygienic habits in employees. And this is also going to be somewhat related to the 2019 inspection year of being that it was the first inspections that have occurred in our state. So just some outcomes of that and then how that relates to various parts of the rule that we want to focus on just to make sure that our farms are ready to go for upcoming inspections this year and next. So just a couple of housekeeping items just to touch base on, especially because in light of this COVID-19 issue, a lot of us are working from home and myself, um, I'm presenting this from home, so I'm especially aware with these issues, but most of us have been on a webinar at one point or another, but in case you haven't, here's some good tips. So one thing you can do to help your um, bandwidth is to close all the other programs you have running on your computer. If you do start to have any issues with your clarity or pictures loading or sound or whatever, I did provide everybody who registered with a call-in number to this webinar. So you might miss out on some of the graphics, but I think that you'll still have a pretty good idea of what's going on just by listening in. Uh, in terms of just giving you an idea of how this control panel works, there's a chat section where you can type in any questions you might have as we're going. And then, um, there's also a handout section just above that that has a copy of a PDF of this slide deck that we're using just in case you want that afterwards. And it also has a section or has sections through it with links. That way you can click those links rather than typing them in because I know that can be a bit of a pain uh, to do. Um, and then another thing I wanted to say really quickly is that this webinar will be focusing um, on the produce safety rule of the Food Safety Modernization Act in terms of health and hygiene, as well as the question and answer section that we're going to have towards the end with our produce safety staff here in Idaho. Um, one thing I wanted to mention with that is just, again, in light of COVID-19, I've had some questions about whether or not we're going to be focusing on stuff that has to do with the hygienics related to that going on right now. And the answer to that is no, this will be focusing basically only on the produce safety rules. So just keep that in mind that if you're here expecting to get information about that, that we won't be touching base on that. And our question and answer panel will also be focusing only on the produce safety rule. So just to jump right in, um, I know that most of the people that are tuning in today have heard of the Food Safety Modernization Act, known as FISMA. Um, produce safety rule, which will from here on be referred to as the PSR. But if you haven't heard, just to kind of touch base on this a little bit, I'm not going to go into full depth on what this means because there are a ton of good resources that have been created up to this point that explain the rule and set and laid out really clearly in terms of what it means and how to comply with it for all the different um, forms of compliance and how that might affect you on your farm. So this is gonna be just a really brief overview, but here on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, I do have the link, which you can click on later or now if you, you know, kind of whenever, to our website, which the University of Idaho Produce Safety website, which shows you everything you need to know about this. And we have some great videos, some great resources, templates and tools, and also links to the Idaho State Department of Agriculture webpage, which also has a lot of great information. So um, basically the Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA for short, was signed into law in 2011. And basically what the, the set of rules does is gives the FDA the authority to regulate food from farm to fork. Uh, since basically the late 1930s. This is the first set of rules that have come out that have to do with uh, the safe growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fresh fruits and vegetables, especially, or well, in this case, for human consumption. The produce safety rule does focus completely on food that is consumed raw, and that's just because if it um, is cooked after the fact, then it has a pathogenic kill step, which would make it a, less, a lesser risk in terms of um, being able to kill off those pathogens, but food that is consumed raw, like salads and arugula or berries or whatever, stuff like that, 
um, doesn't have that same kill step. And so that's why the produce safety rule is, is relevant and important and only applies to certain fruits and vegetables. And there are prescriptive lists of exactly um, the things that are included in this and the things that aren't. Um, but then again, not all farms are subject to the produce safety rule. I think, well, I mean, it, it's factual that most farms in our state are affected by this in one way or another, but it's not exactly the same for everybody in terms of what is covered completely and what isn't. But, and at this point, I think most people that are watching this have a good idea of whether or not they're covered and if they are, how, but if not, then we have this online decision tool, which is kind of shown on these little iPhone looking um, icons on the right bottom right hand side, which is basically, it's at this uh, link directly above it. And it's a self-led, totally anonymous resource where you can go on and it'll kind of walk you through what compliance means and show you exactly how you're covered by the rule. So if you're still unsure, these two resources, our, our U of I Produce Safety website and our decision tool are a really great place to start. But this again, um, from this slide forth, we'll be focusing more at a higher level of what this means and how to comply with the rule. So just to kind of give an overview, I'm sure most of you guys have seen this before, but if not, this is the Produce Safety um, Rule Compliance timeline basically of how compliance is set forth for all the different sizes of businesses based on a three-year three rolling average of how much money your farm makes in produce sales gross per year. So inspections for this last year um, began for large businesses, that being that top bracket of over $500,000 average per year. And then we're gonna be moving into smaller farm inspections, this middle bracket um, this coming year. So another thing to be thinking about with this as well is, which is a different topic, but it's good to mention it here because we're looking at it, is um, at the far right-hand side, the compliance date for qualified exemption labeling requirement. And that went into effect January 1st of this year in terms of making sure that um, those that have a qualified exempt status are following labeling requirements to put their address and business name um, very promptly and clearly on everything that they put into market or at the farmer's market. It needs to be on their sign as well, which that is something else that you guys can reach out to me for at the end of this if you are in the qualified exempt status, but and we can make sure that we get you covered and taken care of, but I just wanted to make sure that we also um, talk about that just in case that does relate to you. So in terms of FISMA in Idaho in this last year, um, again, it was our first year of regulatory inspections. And so the way that FISMA is broken down in different states across the US is that each state has basically decided whether they wanna take it on at the state level or if they want the FDA to be the people that do the enforcement. So in the state of Idaho, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture enforces the produce safety rule through regulatory inspections. Um, the inspections are tiered uh, as, the, as it's set forth below in the table at the bottom of your screen. So inspections for large farms began this last summer. And then um, this year will be small businesses and then very small businesses will be next year. Um, what is going to be inspected on your farm is whatever falls as being a covered commodity under the produce safety rule. But in terms of what was inspected in 2019, just based on what farmers who fall in the large business category or all other business category grew, were um, this bottom bullet right here, which I kind of listed them all out. And then this next slide, we'll kind of talk more about those commodities because I don't want to talk too much about inspections, but just to kind of give you an overview of what it looked like, just because I think it's really interesting information for us to discuss, especially just in the aftermath of this first round of inspections. So 45 farms total were inspected, and then these various commodities were the ones that we saw in inspections. So obviously onions came out as being, which makes sense because it's one of our, you know, commodities that we see the most or have the most by far in our industry. But Mostly berries, fruits, but then yeah, onions being the highest of the inspected commodities. So some inspection um, demographics at a glance. So this just shows how many farms were inspected in each category of the 45 farms. And then 
percentage of what that looks like in terms of the act activities covered under the produce safety rule that they do. So over 50% being those that do growing and harvesting and then other farms that do packing and holding specifically and then the farms that do all of those things. So it just kind of breaks down each of those sections, which is kind of interesting to just see, you know, demographically what we're looking at in terms of what our operations do. So here is a little bit of a breakdown in terms of how inspections turned out. So of the 45 farms inspected, 29% of those farms had an observation. So what that means is basically when an inspector comes out, they see something on your farm that has to do with the produce safety rule that is in violation with FDA's requirements of what would make an operation be in compliance with the rule. So it's a pretty low percentage realistically. And then, uh, but the, th the other thing too is that of the 29% of individuals, or sorry, of operations that had an observation, 61% of those had multiple observations, meaning that if you were to see one thing out of compliance, you're likely to see one another thing or multiple other things. But the good news is, is that 54% that had observations on their farm or had things that were wrong or out of compliance were able to correct observations on site. Now, we don't know if that helped, like what percentage of those things were able to be corrected. If it were all of them or a couple of them, that's not information that necessarily needs to be disclosed, but it's just, it's good to know that, you know, and, and also what it means to be corrected on site, which I should say, is that they were able to fix it before the inspector left. And so then it wasn't necessarily something that was dinged against them because they were able to correct it while the inspector was still there. So let's say an inspector goes with them and they're inspecting their bathroom facility and they the inspector recognizes that that bathroom is out of toilet paper and they say, oh, it's not it's not stocked and they, not, they might knock them down on that, but then that person can restock that toilet paper on site. And so then that may not be something that they will be in trouble for because they fixed it immediately. And it was just something that, that happened that wasn't as big of a deal that they could fix. So then uh, also on top of that, of the 45 farms inspected, 71% had no observations whatsoever, meaning that there was nothing on their farm that was out of compliance with the rule. So overall, more of our farms had nothing wrong than had observations, which is really great. So. Basically, the way that this uh, webinar series was created was in collaboration with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture in terms of trying to look at inspections and see what large farms struggled with. Where were our biggest areas of non-compliance and how can we translate that into programming and education that can help A, those farms that have been inspected come into compliance with the rule if they haven't already since their inspection, and then B, smaller farms are gonna be inspected this year and next to look at trends that larger farms faced and then figure out how to be ahead of that curve. And it's not to say that everything that large farms were affected by and did incorrectly will affect smaller farms, but I bet, I bet there will be a bit of a trickle down effect in terms of being able to view those trends and then be prepared. So the biggest areas of non-compliance that we saw, um, you'll see also reflect our webinar series. So this one we're in right now, subpart D, health and hygiene. And then next week on Monday, we're gonna have the equipment, tools and sanitation webinar. And then the week after that will be dedicated completely to records. And you may see that records only had two observations, but the thing about records that's a little bit tricky with the produce safety rule is that if you're not doing it, you're gonna have a lot of sections that are out of compliance because it does affect so many different areas of the rule because so many different areas of the rule need documentation and record keeping. So I think that's something that will be really beneficial, especially because a lot of smaller farms may not be keeping records to the standard of which they need to be in order to be in compliance with the rule. So we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second, but um, basically this is the logic behind the way that we have kind of crafted this webinar series. So without further ado, um, this first section is gonna be talking about health and hygiene and basically you know, what have we seen? What does it matter? And how can we be preparing farms in the future for inspections? So again, as I said in the beginning, this is gonna be just a really basic overview of what the rule means related to hygiene. And not all of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about in hygiene is actually 
within the hygiene and employee training portion of the rule. It can be in various parts of the rule just because there are so many different things, as you'll see as we work through these slides, that do kind of loop around and affect hygiene, although they may not be specific to employee hygiene, if that makes sense. So if you need a better baseline and this is too high bar for you because you haven't quite become familiar with the rule, which is totally understandable, just know that this um, link over here on the right hand side will take you to our website. And we do have a, a whole video on health and hygiene, which is really great in terms of laying out exactly what the rule says. But I'm just going to touch on this really briefly so that way we are all on the same page before we move into more of potential inspection observations and how to work through that. So basically, hygiene on the farm is you can boil it all down to people as a source of contamination. So there are a couple of different things that the rule is very pres prescriptive about. So for example, basically anybody, first of all, anybody that's on your farm, regardless of the interval of which they're there, if they are going to be handling food or being in contact with uh, food contact surfaces, so anything that food comes in contact with, they need to be trained in produce safety because every single person that's on your farm is a potential source of contamination. So they need to know how pathogens move and why we need to be concerned about that. And, and so they can therefore meet your expectations on your farm. Additionally, with the training requirement in this section, one supervisor at least, or you know, whoever is in charge of food safety on your farm, it doesn't have to be a supervisor, but the manager, owner, you know, whoever's gonna be training other employees needs to attend um, an FTA approved equivalent of a produce safety training class. So in Idaho, uh, the U of I and ISDA do the Produce Safety Alliance grower trainings throughout the fall and winter across the state. And that's the class, if you've taken that, then you're, you're good to go um, because that's the class that suffices for this requirement. Um, next, employees need to be trained on how to recognize contamination. So potential sources of it, and then also not to help how to not harvest contamination and how to correct issues that may arise. So the ways that we see this on the farm would be recognizing signs of sickness. So understanding, you know, obviously if an employee is sick, you don't want them there because A, I mean, immediately you don't want to get sick. You don't want your other employees to get sick. And then B, obviously the viral pathogenic risk of that becoming a contaminant in our food. Uh, another part of this is hand washing, when and how, which we'll talk about in a minute. Jewelry policies, so not using or not wearing it, really any jewelry on the hands, ideally, but especially jewelry that is uncleanable and clunky and has niches and grooves that can act as a harborage point on the hands that can become in contact with produce. And then secondarily, not in this section, but something that's also part of jewelry, is it becoming a physical contaminant in terms of, you know, you're wearing earrings and then whoops, one's in the arugula and you're never going to find it. So that can become an issue. Uh, and then next, eating and drinking, where it's appropriate, how to designate um, break areas, which we'll talk about. And then another one that's not necessarily as outlined in this part of the rule, but animals on the farm and, you know, having cats and dogs. And if you're petting them and if you're, wa you're washing your hands, an animal shouldn't obviously be in covered produce areas anyways in terms of domesticated animals. But and then just making sure that you know, if workers do come in contact with animals of any kind, that they recognize that as a time that they need to be washing their hands afterwards and slash, slash or ideally just limiting all contact in, in general with animals. Um, so then training needs to occur at least upon hire, well, definitely upon hire, and then at least annually thereafter. So that means, you know, if you have people coming in for harvest, kind of no matter what they're doing on the farm, just making sure that they understand these different things that are related to hygiene. So when to wash their hands, where are the bathrooms, um, that kind of thing. And the rule is more prescriptive on that. But one thing that it does talk about for sure is just being cognizant of the different barriers that can exist in making a training as equitable as possible. So that would be language barriers, literacy levels, learning methods. So, you know, making sure that you're doing demonstrations, you have photos, you have a translation if necessary, dependent on your demographics or posters on the walls or basically just covering all your basics, base, bases, there we go, to make sure that you're making it as effective as possible in your trainings. 
Next, uh, hygienic facility maintenance and accessibility. So something that's not necessarily in this uh, specific section of the rule, but if you're if you don't have the things that employees need in order to maintain their own hygiene, then that's going to make you be out of compliance because employees can't wash their hands in the, in the first place if they don't have soap. So, or you know, whatever respective thing they need. We'll talk about that more here in just a couple of slides. Next, visitor policies. So again, whomever comes onto your farm is going to be another source of contamination. So, and and it's great to have visitors on the farm. You know, food and production and agriculture in general is something that is such a great learning tool, especially for kids in terms of seeing where our food comes from and what it means and having that connection to our food system. But at the same time, it's important to be aware of the fact that every single person that comes in is just an additional stimuli that can be a risk. So how do you control for that? And just making sure that you have a policy for when they come in, they know where to wash their hands, where they can and can't go, et cetera. Lastly, records, there's a record keeping requirement for training in this section, which we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. Um, but that's something that is also a required part of this. And also we're gonna have an entire webinar on this in two weeks, just because records are so important. So the way this is gonna be broken down is, I think one thing that's on the for forefront of a lot of people's minds is, okay, I read the rule, I've been to the class, I've watched the videos, but what does this actually mean? You know, how does this look in real life? How can this affect me? What are they gonna be looking for when they show up, if and when, you know, if I'm covered, by the rule or not, depending on if I will be inspected or not. But for the sake of this, we'll assume that you will be. So when they show up, what are they? What are inspectors going to be looking for? What things can I potentially be dinged for? And so what we're going to do is just kind of work through a couple of examples of what an observation can look like or what non-compliance can look like and things to be thinking about the way that the rule looks in practice. So like, let's say, for example, an inspector comes to your farm and they and this is just under the observation example, they recognize immediately that your operation doesn't have a hand washing facility on site. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. You know, some I've heard of some farms that have their employees go home and wash their hands or they, they wash their hands because it's close enough or they think it is. And they wash their hands at home and then come back or you know, whatever, they don't provide that on site and they don't maybe necessarily see it as a risk. It's a bit of a non-issue to them. So within the rule, this would be an issue because the outcome of that is that employees are unable to wash their hands prior to coming in contact with produce. So, and then the, the additional part of that is, let's say, you know, a farmer's um, logic is that they wash their hands at home and then they walk back or they come back or whatever, but it's more so of what happens between A and B. You know, are their bathrooms at home fully stocked? Do they have, are they using um, their towel that they use to clean their body and, you know, whatever else on the wall? You just don't know. And so there's a couple of different things that can come into play with not providing the facilities that are necessary to secure hygiene on the farm. So at the top, subpart D, 1112.32, personnel must use hygienic practices while well on duty. And basically what this means is that they need to be able to wash their hands. And so then that kind of comes down to subpart L, 1112.130 or 130. Um, you must provide personnel with adequate, readily accessible hand washing facilities. So basically you're gonna be out of compliance in two sections because the employee can't wash their hands if you're not providing the things necessary for them to do their job safely. So the rule review for that is that the Produce Safety Alliance basically defers to the OSHA standards, which require one facility per 20 workers within a quarter mile of the working area, just because that way it's within a convenient and accessible space, or not space, but distance. You know, because at the end of the day, as much as we hate to admit it, when we're not there or the farm manager or whomever is the eyes and ears of the farm is not there. You kind of have to question what employees are going to do. And often at the end of the day, it is kind of a bit of the human condition that we're gonna do whatever is the most convenient. So we've all been in the situation of, you know, using a bathroom or whatever that 
isn't clean and we don't want to use it. And so it's easier to just go to the bathroom in the ditch or outside or whatever. And that's not ideal. But the same comes down to this when the bathroom is far or whatever, like you need to have something there that that they can use that's accessible. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to be accessible, well stocked with the things that are required, which we'll talk about here in a second. And it needs to be clean because, like I said, if it's dirty, nobody's going to want to use that. And in, and in some cases they may not. And then you have to ask yourself the question of, okay, if they're not going in the bathroom, where are they going? And then obviously that just perpetuates this potential for pathogenic concern. So this is something we talk about in PSA training. So this might be something you've seen before, but this is just goes to show that if, you know, you need to have a hand washing facility or station of some kind that is in the field to have them wash their hands before they clock in or you know, whatever your respective situation needs, this is a way to go that can totally be in compliance with the, the rule, but it's not expensive, it's not hard to move, it's not a um, permanent infrastructure or anything like that. So for example, this, I looked up some of these on, on walmart.com just to get an idea of, you know, what these, what these costs can look like. So you have a jug, seven gallon jug, um, water jug that has a twist top and not a plunger so that way you know you push the plunger with dirty hands and then you soap your hand and then you push it again and that's all soapy and then you you know and you just you, you can't get your hands clean so it's a it's ideal to have an open closed valve that just has a slow trickle that you can wash your hands um, you need to have paper towels soap a catch bucket so that way it's all the water the wastewater has a place to go and then you can get rid of that in a way that's not going to have drainage or whatever into sections of your property that you don't want it like into covered areas um, where or areas where covered produce is and then bungee cords aren't necessary but they're good to just kind of keep it in, all in place and then another thing that's not pictured in this is that you will need to make sure that you're using water that's free from e coli just because if you have water that is contaminated with a known contaminant or a known pathogen then there's not really a lot of point in washing your hands just because you're gonna be contaminating your hands again um, while you're trying to clean them to remove the said pathogen. So it's kind of a useless way to go. So here's another example. So if bathrooms are present, but they aren't clean or are in need of restocking. So this would be relevant to subpart D uh, 1112.32, personnel must use hygienic practices while on duty. So if an inspector shows up on your property and they're observing a bathroom facility, but then there's trash on the floor, the trash is overflowing, and then the, you know, for example, the toilet paper bays are empty. So this becomes an issue because all the trash on the floor it can contaminate their shoes, and then their shoes when they walk outside, and or it can blow outside and end up in the field, and then there's, you know, that risk in terms of becoming a harborage for pests. And it's just, it really gets out of control. And then secondarily, if there's no toilet paper, then what are the employees using in lieu of toilet paper? So I don't mean to get too graphic with this, but you know, if someone's going to the bathroom and they don't have toilet paper, they're gonna do the little, you know, stumble over to the paper towel rack. And then there's just a lot of distance in between the two and more space for pathogens to get on the floor and on your shoes. And it just becomes a big issue. So the rule review is basically that you must provide the necessary items for employees to wash their hands in order to maintain their personal hygiene while at work, because you can't expect them to follow their training and keep their hands and their hygiene at the level of which the rule requires if you're not giving them the necessary products and um, environment to do so. So facilities need soap, soap, paper towels, toilet paper, again, hand washing water that's free of E. coli, they need somewhere to throw away trash. And then if you're doing something like the DIY um, hand washing station, then they need somewhere to catch wastewater. And then also it needs to be regularly serviced and cleaned and restocked just to make sure that all these things are being provided and it's providing also a clean environment for employees to keep their own personal hygiene in check. So next, so, you know, you're providing the bathroom and it's clean and it's stocked and okay, I'm doing everything on my end, but now still employees don't know when to wash their hands or they just aren't. So is this a training issue? 
or is it a choice issue or what's going on? So this would be again in subpart D, 11232. So employees must wash their hand before returning to workstation after any break or absence from the workstation. So an example of an observation that could fall in line with this is an inspector coming and witnessing employees returning to the desi from a designated break area and failing to wash their hands before returning to the workstation. So the outcome of that would be that, okay, our employees either not washing their hands enough, like at the right times, or are they just not washing their hands at all? So if they see someone that, you know, is eating or, or doing whatever, and then just going straight back to work, that can become an issue because, um, you know, there's contact with their mouth and, and other things that you aren't gonna want on your food that can become an issue. So the review for this is that you must enjoin, you must train employees on when they're required to wash their hands. So this would be, again, prescriptive. After using the toilet, most of us do that on a daily basis. Every time we go to the bathroom, that one's not super challenging. But before starting work or returning to work, so anytime they're away from their workstation in general, so they go to do something else on the farm, then come back, wash their hands. Before or after eating or smoking, again, because of contact with your mouth and your food and where's that been and all these different things before putting on gloves so that way if your hands underneath the glove are clean so if one in break breaks or something and you touch produce on accident with a with a bare hand then it's not immediately potentially contaminated by your dirty hands after touching animals or animal waste so you know domesticated animals ideally they're not there at all um, but working animals or whatever um, if you if you have those on your farm, just making sure that there's a clean break between the two to make sure that we understand how contaminants can potentially move and controlling for that. And then kind of the catch all for this screen or not this screen, but like um, this topic is to also be training on any uh, any other training on washing hands any other time hands may become contaminated because that is just an indicator that employees understand the importance. So it's not just, oh, I need to wash my hands after the the bathroom or after I eat or whatever, but it's understanding all the times that may not be prescriptive in the rule that washing your hands is necessary because it could be a potential for contamination. So, you know, the rule might not say, oh, hey, Dave, you need to wash your hands after you pick up a shovel out in the field that has, you know, bird poop on it before you return to work because it can't be that specific, but just understanding that, hey, that's a potential risk. I understand that's a risk. I recognize it. And so I've washed my hands because I recognize that. So a lot of one thing we hear a lot in on farm readiness review or in classes or just talking to farmers in general is I did train them. I told them, but they're not doing it. Now what? Because training really is only half of the equation. You know, you you give them the resources, the posters, the signs, the stickers, the hand washing soap, the everything. But the other half of them of that is them coming to the table and doing what they need to keep produce safe as well. But at the end of the day, regardless of that, outbreaks will fall on the employer. And that's just an unfortunate fact of the situation. So here's some things that you can do to kind of troubleshoot this to try to get everybody on the same page. So one is just education and explaining the importance of food safety again, you know, doing um, educating and retraining annually and then also um, at various intervals thereafter, so maybe after an observation of an inadequacy or after an inspection of, you know, you have someone come and observe that an employee doesn't wash their hands. And so maybe that's an isolated instance where one person didn't do the right, the right thing at one interval. But just in case, you know, let's get everybody together. Let's do this again. Let's rehash this. Let's talk about why this can become a problem. Um, visual reminders, hanging up hand washing signs and pictures and statistics or kind of, you know, whatever would be helpful. I'm gonna talk about this at the end of the webinar, but we have a ton of free resources through the University of Idaho that we can send to you if you sign up um, on our ordering form or just email me and we can make sure that you get everything you need. And then another one that can be really helpful, but it's a little bit more aggressive, um, potentially depending on the situation is putting hand washing stations in visible places to monitor activity. So this could look like, you know, something that's out in the open where, you know, they wash their hand or sorry, they go to the bathroom and then they have to come out and wash their hands. Like they can wash their hands in the bathroom, but they need to wash their hands again before they go to work out in the field or kind of, you know, wherever you want to place it, whatever makes sense for you. But basically something that allows you to keep 
monitoring on that employee or on all of your employees to make sure that they are washing their hands all the time regardless. And then lastly, in implementing some type of you know, corrective action measure. So this could look like a three strike policy, which maybe that's too many for you. Maybe you have a one strike policy, kind of whatever, but hey, I noticed you didn't wash your hands um, or you did this or that and you should have washed your hands and I noticed that you didn't after doing that. And so let's have that conversation and this is your warning. And then maybe after that, it's a termination type thing. But um, just making sure that you are aware and just knowing that the employees know that they have a vested stake in making sure that this is something that they follow through with as well. So another thing that this can look like is break areas aren't designated. So what that means is that in subpart D, 1.1.12.3.2 of the rule, and personnel must not eat, chew gum, or use tobacco products in an area used for a covered activity. So what an observation could look like is an inspector coming and seeing employees eating lunches in their workstation, then returning to, to work upon completion of lunch. And it doesn't specify in this um, whether they wash their hands or not, because I mean, it, it may not be as important because either way, it's still something to be talking about. So the outcome with that would be that employees run the risk of A, which we were talking about before, but contacting their mouths, food, and then produce, or getting you know trash in the field. There's a lot of different things or getting dropping food on produce. So the rule review for this is that you have to designate areas for employees to take their breaks. Break areas don't have to be a specific room. You don't have to make specific infrastructure. It doesn't have to be part of the packing house and the back of the packing house. It can be, that's a good way to do it, but it just basically needs to be clearly communicated and located so that it won't become an issue. It won't become a source of contamination. We can say, hey, you know, here's this fence that's on the perimeter of our property that's out of the way of produce and or you know the harvesting area and that's where we take breaks and here's the trash can here's the bathroom here's where you wash your hands etc so it can be in their car it can be kind of anywhere just as long as it's obviously safe um, you provide access to water they can wash their hands before they clock back in and it's away from produce that's it, it reduces your risk these are the things that are necessary under the rule. Another thing that we we see and hear about a lot um, in terms of things that people need help with is record keeping in this section and in all sections. So that could be your records aren't up to date or they are non-existent totally. So there are a couple of different things that this can fall into line with. So that would be subpart C1112.22 all workers, including temporary, seasonal, part-time, and contract personnel who handle covered produce or food contact surfaces must be trained in health and hygiene. And then subpart C, 112.30, you must establish and keep records of trainings. So basically what this means is that, again, as I was talking about a few slides ago, is everybody who comes onto the farm just increases that risk for being a pathogenic concern. So you want them to know what you expect of them. and and when to wash their hands, where to wash their hands, how to how to handle themselves, and how to reduce their risk as being something that is introduced into the environment of your farm. So an observation example could be an inspector coming and asking for your training records, and then as they're going through the record, they notice that multiple people that are actively harvesting aren't on that record as being trained in health and hygiene. So the problem with this and also the outcome is that regardless of whether you've trained them or not, the inspector is gonna assume that they haven't been just because there's no record of it. And so that's gonna be a my word versus theirs kind of situation. So you just need to keep a record of it. And then the rule basically just says that a record includes the date of the training, topics covered, names of persons trained, and the signature from the supervisor. And I'll talk about this in the next few slides, but we have resources for you. If you want copies of templates for record keeping, they're in Word format. You can edit them and make them look like exactly what you need. And you can also um, use, if you go through GAP certification, you have GAP audits and you keep records for GAP already, you can use your records for both FSMA and GAP. So that way, you know, if you have um, records for trainings for employee hygiene or, you know, kind of whatever, obviously it would be hygiene relevant to this topic. Um, you can just make sure that 
your your records have the things that FISMA requires, have the things that GAP requires, keep one log and it suffices for FISMA as well. So don't, it's not a reinventing the wheel kind of thing. It's just making sure that you're doing it. So just some resources I'd like to talk about really quickly. Um, we do provide on-farm readiness review in collaboration with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture and the University of Idaho Extension Office. Um, they're usually led by myself and then one or two of the inspectors from ISDA. When we come out and we meet with you at your farm, it's on your time, whenever works for you, it's free of cost. And we show up on your farm and we kind of work you through the produce safety rule in a very palatable and for the lack of better terms, uh, like layman's terms kind of way to make sure that it makes sense because most of us don't sit down and read code for fun. No one does that unless you wrote the produce safety rule and even maybe not them, you know, so just to make sure that we, you understand it, you know what you need to do. We don't take notes. We don't take pictures. We don't um, really discuss it after the fact. It's completely educational, voluntary, and we leave you with a list of things to think about and prioritize and stuff that may be out of compliance with the rule. And then we conclude with a walk around of your farm to just um, try to get our eyes on the situation and make sure that everything um, from your records to um, what you're doing in practice on the farm all fits in with compliance and sets you up for a good inspection. And we have seen that people that have gone through on-farm readiness review and then were subsequently inspected actually did better on their inspections because they were prepared and they had us out to look at their farm. So that's one resource. And then secondarily, um, the University of Idaho Extension Produce Safety website link is here, right here. And it's a great resource as well. Um, we have a ton of training videos in English and Spanish. We have templates for documentation. You can sign up for our produce safety newsletter, which goes out quarterly and breaks down all the updates and resources and webinars and everything that's coming out related to produce safety in Idaho and also nationally uh, for different things. Um, it has past webinars. We had a webinar series last year that's all on there. And then all of these webinars from this series, including this one later today, will be posted on there for your viewing later. Uh, Spanish resources. We have a Spanish page that is in the Spanish language and it has all of our resources translated. And then also we have a free service on there for on-farm produce safety resource ordering. So if you want hand washing stickers or training videos or visitor posters or really anything, we can get that over to you um, if you go ahead and just put in whatever things you whatever things you need. So that is going to conclude um, our webinar for the most part in terms of breaking down what the rule means, but now I would just like to open up our live Q&A to see what questions you guys have had or, or may have. If you have questions that have yet to been, be posted, you can go ahead and post them into the question section. Um, and then we have our, P, our pretty safety team here in Idaho, which is gonna be Ariel Agenbrod from the University of Idaho, Coletta Phelps, also from U of I, myself, and then we have Casey Mon, who is our FISMA produce manager, or sorry, FISMA program manager from ISDA for the state. And I'll give hey, everybody Luke. To get on here. Lou, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, this is Colette D. Phelps and I'm monitoring the chat and the questions this morning. And we do have a question that came in. The question is, will this webinar count for supervisor training? Um, so I will go ahead and answer that one. And that answer would be no, it, it wouldn't count for supervisor training. So what that would be in the state of Idaho would be our Produce Safety Alliance grower training. So we offer those. We actually just had our last one for this session. Um, well, it was supposed to be just a few weeks ago, but it was un unfortunately canceled due to COVID-19. But we will have more coming this fall 
and then into winter. We have been doing about five a year in all different sections of the state. And also the Produce Safety Alliance is in a pilot process right now of trying to get a online course going, which um, we've had we've had a little bit of feedback on that, but I will be getting that information sent out once they launch that course um, fully, but it's not launched yet. Great, thank you, Lou. We have another question. Is there any information specific for microgreen growers? Um, Ariel, do you want to take that one on? Sure, Ariel, I can take I've that. gone ahead and unmute you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, so as far as we've been told, microgreens um, would follow all the same regulations and rules as all other fresh produce. Uh, if you are getting into sprouts, that is different. Sprouts have their own set of rules and compliance state that are in some ways um, more intensive. But microgreens, if they are being grown and you're doing one harvest cut and they're being sold, um, they would follow the same rules as um, as other produce under the Produce Safety Alliance. I mean, under the Produce Safety Rule. Great, thank you. We don't have any other questions, so uh, thank you all for participating this morning and for the questions that you asked. Lou, would, I'd like to hand it back to you to talk about the upcoming webinars. Yeah, sure. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for attending today and also thank you so much for all that you guys do, especially, you know, right now in light of of things being, I guess, interesting for all of us. It's I think it goes a bit unsaid in terms of all of what farmers do for our our state and our country and it's and it's awesome and I'm happy that everyone has tuned in this morning to learn more about this and what it means for us in our state. Um, so our produce safety webinar series continues for the next two weeks. So coming up on this coming Monday, uh, April 13th, we're gonna be talking about sanitation basics under the produce safety rules. So essentially kind of what has been seen in inspections overall, what trends we've seen, and then it'll kind of follow the same format in terms of what, um, I guess what observations can hypothetically look like and how to address that on the farm. It will be a little bit more in depth just because it is a bigger section in terms of the way that it can affect so many different things on the farm and have concentric effects as well. And then the week after that on April 20th, and these will all be at the same time as well in the series, we're gonna be talking about record keeping and how to simplify record keeping on the farm, what records are actually required, what does it mean to keep a record, what's required to be in a record, um and that will pretty much conclude this series for our april series so and then just um one last thing i'd like to add is down here at the bottom we have our produce safety staff or at least a couple of them we have a couple more that aren't on here but um if you have any questions you can kind of field them up north to colette down here to in the south to ariel and myself and then if you have any questions related to inspections or regulatory stuff with the produce safety rule, then Casey Mon at ISDA is a good person to reach out to with those types of more technical questions related to inspections. But um, I think that's everything that I have. Thank you so much for tuning in. And does anybody else have anything to add? No, thank you for that great webinar. And thanks for joining us today. Okay, thank you so much guys. Have a great day and stay safe.